first started studying elephants 20 years ago, I have to say I was a little intimidated, not just by all of the people that came before me and all, all of what was known about elephants, um, I was also intimidated by their own intelligence. So not only do we know quite a bit about elephants, they're so intelligent it's really difficult to know exactly what the elephant is thinking behind that stall. So this is what I had to deal with. Um, well, we all know about the elephant in the room that we choose not to address, but I want to talk about a different elephant, the kind of elephant that we don't see based on our own biases or what people tell us that is not there. And I learned three lessons in my research that I'm going to go through with you today about how to see the elephant in the room that we can't see. Now, first, I'm going to take you on a little safari here and have you look at two elephant rumps. This is sometimes what you'll see on safari because elephants like to turn around and face you like that. Maybe they'll sniff at you, but they, they don't want to show their faces. So this is what you get. Now, have a look here at these two enormous elephant rear ends and think about what you're looking at. They're big, they're kind of wrinkly. Uh, one guy's leaning, there's a little bit of wet up there. Well, what I'm looking at is at the bottom of the screen. I'm looking at their tails. Their tails tell me an enormous amount about these two elephants. One of them's got a really long eight-inch tail, uh, and the tail here goes far up on the inside of the tail and then little poof on the outside. The other guy's got kind of scrawny tail on the inside of the tail and then a little bit, maybe three, four inches on the outside. I actually know these two characters really well. Now, you probably didn't, weren't thinking about those two tails, but I'm going to take you on a little journey here to see how you can convert what you're looking at into something that's really important to see. I'm going to take you on a little safari to Atasha National Park, Namibia, for the first chapter of this story, and it's about their communication. I came from a world of studying insects that communicate seismically, and was suddenly thrown into this elephant world and see that, wait a minute, elephants are doing the exact same thing as my insects were doing. They're freezing, orienting towards the source, even freezing mid-stride. As they're walking, they walk, walk, and then freeze, sometimes lift up a foot, then take a few more strides, freeze, and that's kind of what my insects were doing. They're listening for a female standing on the plant, move up, freeze, move up. Okay, they're a little bit faster than elephants. But um, I saw this pattern, and I thought, okay, nobody else has talked about this in elephants. Can they actually feel the vibrations of their vocalizations through their feet. They're certainly behaving that way. Uh, every time I would see this, there'd be another um, elephant group coming in soon after they started doing this freezing behavior. Now, this is a very low-frequency elephant rumble um, made at 10 hertz for a male, 20 hertz for a female. And what I'm showing you here is that these low-frequency signals, the higher harmonics, uh, dissipate very quickly, and it's the low frequencies that travel long distances. Well, painstakingly, we took a lot of time to show that these same vocalizations propagate across the surface of the Earth and provide the exact same signal if an elephant were able to detect that signal with their feet. Now, a lot of animals do this, but nobody's ever thought about elephants doing this. We've thought about insects, um, um, frogs, snakes, um, but large mammals, no. So what I did was take a call that I knew very well. This is a call that I recorded when elephants were um, afraid of lions. This is an anti-predator call. And I'm playing it back through a boombox to see if I could help farmers chase elephants out of their fields in the early days of my work. Here comes the matriarch, and she's going to pay attention to these three calls here. Now, having had this experience with this call, I know that I have a call that will elicit a strong response. 
And of course, we don't use this very often, but it's, it's a tool to help farmers keep elephants out of their fields instead of shooting in the air or even wounding them with a shotgun. Uh, it's kind of a war zone out there in some places. But what we did was take that same vocalization, cut off all the higher harmonics, and propagate it through the ground, and then see how the elephants respond. So this is all done randomly timed. And what we expect is that they freeze right after the delivery, and they face the source, and then they clump up into tighter family groups, which is a sign of wariness, and then they leave the waterhole much sooner than they would otherwise. Now, what do we take from this? That elephants can detect these vibrations in the ground. Not only can they detect them, they can interpret them as signals. And we did the study again and showed that not only can they detect them as signals, they can discriminate callers. So we use the same kind of anti-predator call from another country, played that back to the ground. They didn't respond nearly as dramatically as they did in the air. So we thought, wow, I, I didn't expect it to be that sophisticated. So we started to do some anatomical work and look at the fact that they um, can detect these signals through two different pathways. Bone-conducted pathway, this is the malleus, very enlarged malleus, is really helps an animal if they're freezing. There's inertia going on where the malleus will move as the body is stationary. Um, then I'm showing you this uh, foot pad here to show you that actually not much of the elephant foot is on the ground. It's got a really nice pad which helps couple a signal with the ground, kind of like um, acoustic fat in the dolphin. Um, the elephants can also close off their ears and really uh, create what's called a closed acoustic tube, which enhances bone-conducted signals. And they also have another pathway, and that's through their feet. There's uh, somatosensory cells that are um, uh, called piscinian corpuscles, and we all have them too in our hands and feet and other places. Um, and if you look at them, they're like an onion. So when there's a vibration, they shift and send a nerve impulse to the brain. So we went back out and asked Beckham here, our musk bull, to respond to an estrus call. He very eagerly agrees to this, and he's now searching. We play in the air and the ground, trying to figure out how he's assessing his environment, which signal is more important, and how is he localizing it through the air and through the ground. He comes right past the source here, past this brush pile. That's where the speaker and the seismic uh, delivery is walks all the way out to the other end of the field, and we wait till we, he gets to the edge to then present him again with the signal. Sure enough, turn sideways, sideways, comes immediately back, directly back to the source, very eagerly looking for a new girlfriend. Um, this is the, the new girlfriend. He's kind of disappointed that she's only a vocalization. But, um, but what he told us was the amount of time he spends assessing the environment in the ground versus in the air and how we're trying to tease apart now how he localizes those sounds uh, between bone conducted or, um, say, placing their feet as sensors farther apart to try and triangulate that signal. Uh, and this is an ongoing study, but it's also gotten us thinking about our own vibrotactile sense, and maybe we can use this sense that we haven't really paid that much attention to, but people with hearing impairments do. And so we're designing a, a vibrotactile hearing aid uh, for the hearing impaired for, based on this research. So, first chapter done, elephants communicate in a modality that we hadn't expected before. Uh, second chapter is, the question is, are male elephants social? Well, the prevailing theory, and it's a little dark here, but there's a lone bull out there wandering around, remembering things all by himself, and the only time he interacts with another is maybe a clash over a nice, attractive female. Um, but that's not really the case. Bulls grow up in a tight-knit family group with all of their siblings, cousins, aunts, and they spend a lot of their youth causing trouble at the waterhole, of course, and then getting into trouble at the waterhole, and then finally getting in trouble with mom because she's just had about enough, and she pretty much kicks him out. And sort of feelings almost mutual at that point, but not really. He's a social animal. He doesn't want to be by himself. So what does he do then? He goes out and searches for um, companionship and looks for males that will take him in. And there are certain males that really want to be social and gather up these groups. 
And so if you see a situation like this, our dominant bull's right in the middle there, Greg, he actually has this very um, highly bonded associated group. So how do you prove that those guys didn't just randomly come in together, they're all thirsty, it's noon, and they're all here together? Well, we take these sociograms, number 22 is the dominant bull, and we prove that, yes, in fact, this is not random chance. These individuals are bonded, and um, they have these ritualized behaviors within these groups. And one of them is this greeting, a trunk-to-mouth greeting, which is a sign of respect. Uh, I see you, maybe even a salute to the Don. Um, and this is learned at a very young age. So, of course, these males are going to take this with them and also even heighten the greeting when they see um, the, the dominant bull here is being greeted by two subordinates with the trunk placed in the mouth. And it's kind of like the Mafia Don where the underlings come and kiss the ring. Uh, it's very, very ceremonial. <laughs> Uh, as well as the sparring behavior, very ceremonial. Also coordinating calls as they leave the water hole, something that has been described in females but not in males. And then the other advantage of a bonded group is that you can f um, form a coalition and the male, the dominant male, all he has to do is look. It's just like uh, Jack Nicholson, the departed, when he comes out of the room, he's pushing up his sleeves. You don't need to know what bad stuff happened in that back room. All you need to do is see his eyes. And that's what these guys do. They don't want any fight. They know this guy is trouble. And so he can really coordinate these aggressive actions against others. But then you have some crazy years, very wet years, where the guys are a little more mixed up. It's, um, you don't have linear hierarchies in the wet years as you do in the dry years. And here comes in the Chicago Don. Um, marching up to our New York City Don, and you can see his ears are pinched, he's, he's standing really aggressively, marches right up to him, and the New York Don's like, oh, it's all right, it's all right, I, I promise, I promise I was going to pay you. And, you know, you get the Marlon Brando going, you told me you were going to pay me, what's going on? <laughs> so, there's a lot of elephant politics very similar to humans, let me tell you. We could talk a lot more about that. Um, but, Although we might not get those dons reconciling, what you do get in these groups is that when there's an altercation, the younger bulls will reconcile by placing their trunk in the, in the um, dominant bull's mouth, and that kind of um, appeases the situation. So if you had any doubts about male elephants being social, I recommend going back out into the wild and having a second look, and I think you'll be surprised by what you see. Now, my third chapter of this story has to do with how individuals are treated within family groups, and are some elephants more equal than others? So the stereotype is, here's a really nice matriarch. She's helping a young mother lift a baby out of the trough. It's not the matriarch's baby. It's a young mother within the group, all very nice and um, really supportive within the family. Well, when you start looking outside the family, there's actually a lot of competition. This family is just you know, just tossed away from the water hole. They're innocently there drinking, but no, 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 this, this other family, the warriors, come in and they push the actors out very aggressively. Well, so we start looking at this dominance within families to try and understand what's going on within the family. If you have such nastiness outside, well, what's going on inside? Um, and the understanding is that dominance within family groups is thought to be based on size um, and, and age which means that the next matriarch in line, it's more important to have wisdom, it's more important to be older than it is to be part of the bloodline. So that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, but this past field season was very dry, we had a lot of births, and I started to see something that just didn't fit. The, I'm asking the question, these two calves in this photo what is their experience going to be in life based on the dominance ranking of their mom? Is that dominance ranking going to be transferred to that calf? And let me tell you a, a story about this. Um, this is Paula and her calf, Bruce, new this season. 
Paula's very low ranking, so she doesn't get to drink at the best places. She knows immediately when she comes to the water hole, she goes to the pan, edge of the pan, and she stays there. Um, well, this day, the whole family decides, you know what, it's too hot, we're going to have a bath first, and then we're going to drink, so you got to get out of here. So they push her out of the pan with her baby, that he goes running out after her, and it's such a hot day that she has to cool him down just in the shallows here, while the rest of the babies get to frolic and interact with each other in the mud and, and socialize. Well, he's not allowed to socialize. Now, what is going on here? Here's the second-ranking female um, in the actor's family, and she's about to displace this poor little calf, Groucho, who's son of a very low-ranking female, and she beats on him. And you think, well, what is going on? Fortunately, he has this little friend who keeps coming out of the shadows, probably an older, um, older sister, uh, to help him. So now, that's two examples of within-family strife. Here's a third example. The one running away is Winona, low-ranking in the actor family. The one chasing her is that same female you saw bullying the little bull. Um, she is the second-ranking in this family, and they've had a tiff for a long time. But it's a couple of days before Winona gives birth, and, and Sus Susan's hassling her, hassling her, hassling her. You think, oh my god. She has to know what's going on here. Fortunately, she did give birth, but all of the stress involved in these internal interactions, here's the end of the season. Paula is trying to lift Bruce up. He's so weak. She's so stressed. She's lost a lot of... Um, it looks like she's lost a lot of milk, so she's not able to feed him properly. You can see in the lower panel, these are, are um, younger members of the... Uh, higher-ranking individuals, they're not even letting her near them to help shade the baby or uh, interact in any way. So you have to wonder, what, why would this happen? And you know, one evolutionary example, uh, explanation would be, well, optimal foraging theory says that um, you know, group size has to be a certain way so that you can maintain fitness within the group. If you have more than 15 individuals, more than 30 individuals, you can't feed um, properly. So somebody's making decisions. Someone's making the cuts. And we call it fission-fusion society where females come and go. But actually, it looks like it's not an, a passive process. It looks like an active process. And what are we making our decisions based on? Is it the matriarch and her direct line and everyone else gets pushed out? Or is it more egalitarian where it's based on age? Well, it doesn't seem based on age because it seems like whole groups are ostracizing individuals. Um, and that also makes you wonder, well, is reproductive suppression going on? This definitely happens in other animals, but it hasn't been documented in elephants. So I want to close by bringing up an uh, Indian proverb where seven blind men approach an elephant and one of them touches the tusk and thinks it's like a pipe, one of them touches the trunk, thinks it's like a hose, one touches the um, tail and thinks it's like a branch. And what I think happens sometimes in research is that I might have my own understanding by holding on to that tusk and somebody else has an understanding by holding on to the trunk without really coming together and seeing the whole elephant. And so, um, one of my take-home messages is we all have our own inherent biases based on our experience of whatever our research is, or culturally, or in relationships. But there's so much more to see if we just let go of the things that we hold so dear and think we know, and try and embrace that unknown together. And in that way, although it's critical to build on the shoulders of giants and, and build on the work of those that came before us, it's also really important not to be limited or intimidated by that work and those giants. Thank you.